Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for our first of the year uh, virtual meeting with some of our live animals. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Rachel, and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum. As you can probably tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home, like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of the living animals that call the museum home. You might be surprised to learn that the museum even has live animals, but we do have over 100 different species of living animals that are in places like our nature lab, the new Bugtopia exhibit in the Discovery Center, and some that live behind the scenes, which is actually what you're going to get to see today. Pretty cool. I'm joined today by some of our live animal program team and along with our animal ambassadors, they're here to help connect your hearts and minds to the science that happens at the Natural History Museum. Forrest Urban, who you'll be hearing from in a moment, is our manager of invertebrate living collections at the museum, and he has a few special friends to share with you today. We also have some helpers from our education department. Agnes, Lindsay, Jessica, and Rocio will be assisting behind the scenes. Thanks so much, team. We'll be together for about 30 minutes and get to meet one of our amazing animals. After Forrest is done sharing, we're going to answer some of your questions about the animals that we've seen. Now, this might be a different format of Zoom than some of our students joining today are used to. You won't see any of your classmates or your teacher or any of the other people watching this program today. And we can't see or hear you. You'll only be able to see and hear us. Since we can't actually see one another, I do want to take a moment to make a special shout out to students joining us from all of today's schools. Welcome, everyone. I love seeing some familiar friends that are joining us again today. Since we can't see any of you and you can only see us right now, we're going to use the chat function to ask questions of our presenters. During the presentation, if you're watching this on Zoom, you can click on the chat box to type in a question or ask your adult to help type in a question for you that we'll try to answer at the end of the presentation. Your chat box might look a little different depending on what device you're on right now. If you're on a tablet, your chat button will be in the upper right hand corner. If you're on a computer or a laptop, your chat button will be on the bottom in the middle. And that's the same uh, place it'll be if you're on your phone watching right now. Type your question directly into the chat for us to see it, and your question will only be seen by the museum staff who are running this Zoom right now. The chat box is currently closed, but we will open it up during Forrest's presentation. We ask that all of our friends joining us today only put questions or comments related to the presentation in the chat. This helps us make sure we can get through as many questions as possible. And to be respectful of our helpers, we should also make sure we are communicating respectfully and using appropriate language in the chat. Folks that are not following our code of conduct today may be asked to leave today's program. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but in case we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to record your ideas so you can learn more about the animal we're exploring today on your own. If you'd like, grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching. You can note down any of those questions you may have maybe a few facts that you've learned or draw or write a description of what the animals look like. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna switch our camera over to Forrest so we can meet our live animals today. And you'll see me again in a little bit. Hey, Forrest. Hey, Rachel. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm back here in the lab again today for some special behind the scenes of some insects that we don't have out in the museum. I have with me our walking stick collection, and these are incredible insects, right? You've probably heard of them. These are the masters of camouflage. They've got their, their ability to blend in, right? That's what camouflage is on lock. And let's learn how they uh, use camouflage throughout their whole lives, right? Well, first let's look at an ice spy picture and see if we can detect it looks teeny tiny on my side let me change my screen okay let's see if we can detect what's going on in this picture so in this picture there are several walking sticks how many can you see you have to put your nature eyes on right there's clearly a bunch of sticks in there right regular old sticks that grow on trees but if we try to identify some walking stick insects what we're looking for are right all insects have six legs walking sticks also have antenna 
And so can you can you see? I see three in this picture. There may be more, but I've been able to identify three. If we look at the one on the left, I can see two legs on the left side and another two legs on the right side. And then I see some things that look like antenna. And then on top of that, I see another walking stick. So there's two walking sticks on the left side. Now, one thing that's cool about walking sticks is that they're trying to blend in. They don't want to be detected at all because they're living on plants. They don't build shelters. They don't build houses. They don't burrow into trees. They don't go underground. Their whole life is living on plants. So they're trying not to be seen. Who do they not want to be seen by? Well, they're herbivores and they don't want to be seen by other herbivores. They don't want to be eaten by other herbivores. Now that's both good and bad. And they don't want to be eaten by predators either. So they're really, really, really trying to blend in. That's their main defensive strategy is to not be seen. And so they have their exoskeleton is specially evolved, specially adapted to look like what they live on to essentially blend into their house. Be like us trying to wear clothes that like blended into the wallpaper or the furniture. That's what they're doing, but they don't have to put these clothes on. They've evolved to have these colorations through their exoskeleton. Even the shape of their exoskeleton is shaped like, like branches, like leaves, like thorns, all those things. And so I see Two on the left side, you have to really look, right? Put your nature eyes on, really look for a, a body, legs, and antenna. And then I see one on the right side, he's hanging down. So if I had a pointer, I wouldn't be able to point, but I don't think I can point those out. So really look and see if you can identify those three insects. And we're gonna look at, I have a whole another live uh, eye spy that we're gonna do later on. This is just for warm up practice. And so they try to blend in, number one, but they also, right, they don't wanna be blend in so much that they're actually eaten by the other herbivores, or if they do, they wanna have some sort of defense. And so the same way that plants grow thorns as a defense against herbivores, right, things that eat plants, walking sticks have also evolved thorns on their bodies as a defensive strategy. They don't all look like sticks. Okay, so if we look at the next slide, we can see what are called jungle nymphs. Now these are from Southeast Asia. We have these here in our living collection, uh, Western Malaysia specifically. Uh, you can see that one, they get to be really big. And there's a difference between males and females. That's called sexual dimorphism. But look at all the thorns on their bodies, so super thorny. And then they can also go into defensive postures because if they have a lot of thorns on their legs, they'll throw their legs out wide to show off all of those thorns on their legs. Uh, if we look at the next slide, we can look at another one of those males more closely and see how, I mean, there's just coated with thorns thorns on both sides of the legs, thorns all along the head, all along the thorax, all along the antenna, just covered in defensive thorns. And then they can even go into poses. And so think of one of our yoga poses, right? Well, this is a jungle nymph defensive pose is what I would call this. They go into a handstand and then take their back legs and throw them out wide and show all of those thorns. And then they'll try to catch something in the thorns by flicking their, their, their legs uh, up and down. And then you can see the thorns all along the abdomen, both sides on the outside, down the middle, down the back, just covered in defensive thorns. Now they can also hiss. And so when they get really defensive, they'll suck in air um, and pump their, pump it through their wings and make a hissing sound. Some California native walking sticks can also mace. And so, right, they no walking sticks have fangs. They can't inject venom. They don't have a stinger like, say, a scorpion, but they can 
uh, they can, some of them can mace, not all, it depends upon the species. We don't have the species here that do mace because we don't like to get maced in the face every time we change their food. And they can hiss and they have all these other uh, defensive strategies. Some of them go into those scorpion-like poses, even though they don't have a stinger like a scorpion does. We have these here. These are called Australian walking sticks, but their bodies are also super thorny, right? Super camouflaged in. Even their legs look like, like uh, parts of a plant, parts of a leaf, parts of a stick. Amazing, amazing adaptations. Another thing related to a walking stick is something called a walking leaf. And a walking leaf is in the same group. They're, they're herbivores just like the walking sticks are, but it's a, it's a separate um, subgroup. They can be different colors depending upon what the color of the plant is that they live on. So they can either be different shades of green. They can be <clears throat> brown, looking more like a dead leaf if they're living on deader leaves or if it's gone into kind of a fall uh, part of the year. It, the color doesn't change right away. Like if, I was, if one was living on a brown leaf and then it moved to a green leaf, it wouldn't shift right away. It would take a few days, but they can change color. And then the color can also be a mix of the two and look really more like a dead leaf. Um, and this is an effective strategy looking more like a dead leaf really, really blending in because things often don't like to eat dead leaves. And so you'd be less likely to get uh, eaten or nibbled on by another herbivore if you looked like a dead leaf. And it really helps in the camouflage. I mean, just look at the, how intricate, how detailed that dead leaf is. It even looks like there are veins, like all leaves have veins in the leaves, browning, brown patches and dying spots. Really, really incredible. Another way that they have a special adaptation is in their locomotion. That's how they move, right? Because if you're trying to look like a leaf or a stick and blend in, you can't just really be walking around fast because you'd blow your cover. And so they even have a special adaptation for locomotion. And so they will just kind of sway and rock back and forth slowly to try to imitate a walking uh, or a leaf kind of blowing in the wind, slowly back and forth. Let's see here. Looks like we're having a little bit of problem with the rendering of the video, but you can go back to YouTube. You can uh, Google walking leaf locomotion or walking leaf movement and see some amazing footage. That one's walking up to a large female philium. And so they all walking leaves start out tiny. We'll talk about their reproduction in a minute and they get called nymphs and they get larger and larger and larger to the full grown version. Now they also have wings. And so it's usually not readily ap apparent if you can see the wings or not. Um, they're usually tucked into their body but they also have wings. And so the wings are more for, they pop the wings open and they glide using gravity to take them down to a lower elevation. It's not like an act of flight of being able to control where they're going. It's just a gliding that they're able to do, but they all have wings and the males have longer and larger wings uh, than the females. Usually the female wings are very reduced in size and the females are usually also much bigger than the males um, because it's the male's job to um, fly around and find the females and the females stay hunkered usually um, in place. But let's talk a little bit about their, their uh, reproduction, which is also super fascinating. So most walking sticks are what's called parthenogenic. That means that females can without having their eggs fertilized, fertilize their own eggs by themselves and reproduce themselves, essentially cloning themselves. And they do this when things are going well, when the climate is stable, they have enough food, things are going well. 
They don't spend extra energy on producing males and they just clone themselves because when you have more females, then you can reproduce more offspring because the females are the ones that lay the eggs. They only produce males when things are, are something's gone wrong, things are going bad, then they'll produce males, but males are rare. Usually it's all females in a parthenogenic kind of colony reproducing themselves. And they all come are emerged from a single egg. This is a little walking stick that emerged out of a single egg. Can, can you imagine that whole body was folded and tucked into it into an egg and then unfolded itself, pop the cap off the egg. They don't eat their way out. They find a way on the inside to pop the cap from the inside and find their way out of the egg that way. Super cute. And we're going to look at some eggs because I think they're really beautiful. We get to our creature cam, which I think we should do now. So let me change my video to my creature cam. Let's see. Here we go. So the first thing I want to look at is the jungle nymphs. These are the big ones. These are the really, really big ones. This is the tail here. This tail is also called the ovipositor. So inside of here is where she ejects each egg one at a time through here. Kind of looks like a syringe. You can see all of those thorns all over her body. Turn her here slowly. Those are her wing pads right here. And this is the one that's from Western Malaysia. You can see all of her antenna, the thorns coming off of her head and her back of her thorax. She has her legs thrown forward to try to look more like, more like a stick. See the claws on the tips of her feet here. They're hanging on. <clears throat> See those claws? And there is her face on. She's kind of in a pose here. She was feeling defensive towards me earlier and had given me a few hisses. She's starting to <laughs> undo one leg here, try to get me in these thorns. See all those thorns? They are pretty gnarly definitely draw blood so if i were to pick her up i would use a really thick glove now we're going to look at some other ones that aren't nearly as as thorny but have that sort of um i pretend like i'm a scorpion thing going on and these are the Australian walking sticks here. Love these guys. They are usually really active, <laughs> really curious. See it swaying back and forth. Just, just a wobbly. See his little teeny tiny wings forming underneath there. Barely see them. These are the wing pads still forming. So I think this one is going to eventually be a female. She's only about, oh, six months old now. Can live a couple of years longer in captivity. But she's really trying to look like a scorpion. And here are some of her siblings. Here. even younger and even younger yet is this one 
and even younger yet, that one. We have a pretty large colony here. Let me put this one back. Just show you some eggs of where they emerged. These legs are so sticky. Jeez. All right, let's look through our eggs. All right, have here a couple of different species of eggs just to show you. Different sizes, different patterns. The really large ones are that large jungle nymph, the big green one that we looked at, looked at earlier. Each egg holds one single jungle nymph. See the patterns on the eggs? Isn't that cool? And then this one is the egg of the one that looks like a scorpion. The Australian walking stick. A few more months for these to develop. Now let's go over and play an I Spy game here. Let's see if I can do this. So let's see here. Can you see this big? This is called a Vietnamese walking stick. See how it has its front legs thrown over? Here, there's two legs there and two little antenna there in the middle. So walking sticks, as they mature, they also molt and they can regenerate limbs if they need to. So they'll often lose a leg. The legs are just so delicate. To get, uh, they break easily and get knocked off. And as they molt, They'll get a little bit of leg back, a little bit of new leg back with each molt. It can be pretty funny sometimes because they'll have a little nubbin of a leg and not a full leg. Now that one was brown. This one is more green because when I pulled them out from their habitat, I had a mix of brown and green leaves in there. So this one was on the green. The other one was on the brown. And then let's look at this one. This is the Australian. It's a larger version that looks like the scorpion. See all of those spines, very, very sticky. See it upside down, you can see that one's eating a leaf. They have really amazing mouth parts, right? For, for slicing and dicing through leaves. Not biting and chewing, but slicing and dicing. They can't bite people, so that's their mouth parts. They really have to get the food um, into their mouth to be able to slice it and dice it. They can't chop. Super cool. Let's see who else do we have here. I have a male that has its wings tucked in. Here, this is the one. See the wings? So this is the jungle nymph male. And these are his wings here. He says, you don't know me like that. You don't touch me like that. Super spiky, super blended in. He's just he's just chilling. These are his wings, right? They're probably four times as long as the females for gliding and, and finding uh, during mating season, finding females. Look how all those spikes on the head, just gnarly. All right. All right, great, Rachel. That's all I have to show and tell. If you want to answer some questions, I can flip my camera around here. That sounds great. That was awesome for us. Thank you for sharing. Oh, we I, have forgot, some... I forgot to show one thing, sorry. Oh, please. <laughs> I would have to switch the camera, but which I'm not going to, but all of these little teeny tiny guys, these are little teeny, teeny, tiny baby walking sticks, Vietnamese walking sticks right here. 
so many we're teaching them to eat lettuce they're so small and they're digging it yeah just maybe a week old now two weeks haven't molted yet that's awesome that actually is well related to our one of our first questions that we have from students rosie aiden Seema and Fernando, among other students, were curious, what is the lifespan of walking sticks and walking leaves and um, how long do they live? In captivity, you can have them for a um, year and a half to two years, one individual. And so, you know, they can stay in the egg for a long time. It just depends on the conditions that you provide for them. When I say a long time, I mean like a year. And then they'll go through a series of molt until they reach adulthood and then they won't molt anymore. And so um, from emerging from the egg to adulthood can be about up to a year. Very cool. It's neat that we got to see different phases of them today in the insectary. The yeah. Little tiny babies all the way to the adults. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, could you remind us a lot of kiddos were asking um, what their dietary habits are like. What do they eat? What kind of leaves and things like that? Most uh, walking sticks have a set of plants that they'll eat. It's usually, I don't know if you're familiar with these terms, but things like uh, oaks, brambles, pyracantha, uh, usually things, and those are like big families. And so the oak especially is a huge family. And so anything in those, in those families, I'm trying to get it in focus here. <laughs> Time for their close up. <laughs> awesome. Uh, let's see, I'm looking at our questions here. Judy was curious, do we have, I think you mentioned this, but do we have any native um, walking sticks that are native to California? Yep, we do. There's a, not, not too many, but there's a few species native to California. Um, not easy to find, right? Because they're, they're so camouflaged in. And when you do find them, you have to be cautious because uh, they do mace. And so, you know, it's like getting pepper sprayed in the face, but there are definitely species in California, for sure. That reminds me of another question we had from Henry. Have you ever thought that you lost a walking stick, but it was just <laughs> camouflage instead? Yep, that's definitely happened. Um, I didn't, I intentionally wore this shirt, but uh, Usually when we're working with the walking sticks, we're wearing lab coats so that we're covered in white. And so, you know, if one were to escape onto us, we would um, be able to find it easier. So we have a lot of protocols that we use when we're working with walking sticks. They're also a controlled species from the USDA and the Fish and Wildlife um, because they're considered agricultural pests and especially these that aren't native um, we don't ever want to have an accidental release of them out into our, you know, California wildlife. Have a situation, the walking sticks try to take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> Could happen. Could happen. Caleb and Atkinson were curious to um, learn a little bit more about mace. How do these insects produce mace? And exactly um, kind of what is mace? Oh, boy. So they you know, are able to, they have kind of a chemistry lab in their bodies where they have dedicated organs where they're mixing up the right chemicals. Um, and in these dedicated organs, they don't then um, become uh, <clears throat> poisoned themselves. And so they shoot it out of glands in their abdomen that become like aerosols and so a fine, an aerosol is a fine mist in the air that spreads um, through molecules in the air, which will irritate your eyes, your skin, your mouth, your nose. Uh, it usually doesn't last very long. Um, it will subs subside in you know, usually less than 30 minutes. 
but basically it's the same technology that we use when we're, you know, making a, a pepper spray. We're make, mixing chemicals to create an aerosol. So when we press a button, it shoots out into the air and affects, um, affects our eyes and skin. They do that built in. It's pretty amazing. That's a pretty neat, yeah, yeah. neat defensive adaptation. That's very cool. We have time for maybe one more question. And Juan was curious, do insects sleep? They do sleep. So, you know, it's a period of, of inactivity. These guys, it's usually um, during the day and they're nocturnal. And so it's a period of inactivity where they're motionless, they're not eating, their metabolism has slowed down. Now they don't have eyelids, so you can't see, oh yeah, they have their eyes closed, they're sleeping. It's, it's not like that, it's just a, a period of, um, of inactivity. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Forrest, and to all the insects that were featured today. This thank was you. so neat. We really loved being with you this morning. Cool, I appreciate it. Bye guys. See you next time. See ya. I'm gonna go ahead and close us out of our program today. Um, let's see, so we uh, invite you all, if you're curious to learn more about our live animal program, to give them a follow on Instagram at NHMLA underscore live animals. You can also see the recording of this program and others on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash NHMLA. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Bye everyone.